Okay, welcome uh, to the software engineering class. Uh, I see everyone got their midterms in. I hope it wasn't too um, arduous, but uh, I did hear that uh, it was kind of a, a press for time situation, uh, but we will go over the midterm. So that'll give you an opportunity to see um, what the point of some of the questions and things were. And uh, I put comments on the grades so you can go through the grades, but you can see sort of a more um, but what I was possibly looking for in some of those questions. So, so today's devotion is Psalm 107, 1 through 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. So I hope you can take encouragement uh, from this verse from Psalm. Um, it is something to keep in mind and to look towards as we go through um, our little bit of trials and tribulations here. Any comments on this particular verse or any connect, particular connection that you may have with this? Okay, well, I hope you can take encouragement from that verse. Uh, so just to remind you, the lecture recordings are on the YouTube channel only or download from Microsoft Teams yourself if you want to. Um, but they are no longer being uploaded to Canvas because the storage space was uh, filling up my Canvas storage space. And so I, I quickly realized I'll have to abandon the uploading it to Canvas. So, um, and then a reminder, we're off for Good Friday. Um, I imagine not too many of you had to be reminded. A lot of you are probably looking forward to uh, that extra time off. And then uh, Monday, April 13th, uh, will be the design document and the chapter nine quiz on implementation, chapter nine implementation quiz. Uh, then Wednesday, April 15th is a combined quiz for chapters 10 and 11. Uh, just a little hint. Um, most of the questions are from 10. There's a few from 11, but most of them are from 10. But, you know, study both uh, chapters but you can spend most of your time on chapter 10. And then I have Monday comma. Uh, I think that was, I'm not sure what Monday comma was it, but there's something due Monday uh, after the 15th. And I, I don't have what that is right now, but you can look that up on campus. And then um, we're gonna finish up chapter 12, support and maintenance. I'd like to uh, kind of review um, what some of the purposes of the work activity log were. And um, I think you all did quite well on that, but just sort of uh, give you sort of um, some of the learning experiences that I want you to gather from that. And then we'll review the uh, midterm. And I'm going to go ahead and share that with all the attendees. So that's, that set of slides has been emailed to you according to Microsoft Teams. Um, All right, chapter nine virtual, no, 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 wrong class. That's operating systems. I'm like, hold on, I just read that. That's not what it's talking about. Did I read the <laughs> wrong one? Oh no. <laughs> okay, I was unfortunately prepping for my operating system class right before class here. Um, did I give the right administrative slide though? Yes, those were, those were all 
software engineering items. Okay, uh, so now we have the chapter 12, software support and maintenance, and we left off on slide seven. So uh, this was just um, the product support life cycle and uh, various portions of the life cycle that we talked about uh, earlier uh, up to the announcement and the release, and then um, the sunsetting or product withdrawal. Uh, thing to keep in mind from this slide is that the software product goes through a lengthy and expensive development process. However, the post-release uh, product support and maintenance cycles can be several times longer and, than the original development process and could in fact be more costly than the original development. Something to keep in mind. Uh, so uh, moving forward, uh, at the end of the product, we have the, the sunsetting process. Um, in which you're trying to eliminate the customer support um, costs for the product uh, and uh, have a planned uh, period when support will no longer be provided for the product. So key things are we, we this is an effort to stop any product additional features enhancements because, of course, if you're going to kill that product, um, you no longer will be working on future features and enhancements. We fix only the high severity problems. Minor problems become a lot less significant and will uh, probably be determined that they will not be fixed, that they um, will never be fixed. And then um, you certainly have to announce the replacement of the product uh, and when support will that for that product will end. So you want to do this well in advance so that, that you don't leave your customers in the lurch. Uh, you want to encourage new and existing customers to move to your new product because hopefully you have a replacement product um, that that you've announced and you want to encourage them with discounts and things like that to help them realize to have them realize that uh, they are valued customers and that you value their business. And then you notify all users of the old product. Um, termination date when the product will will no longer be supported and also uh, probably when when the last time you're going to be selling it although generally uh, you probably won't get too many purchases of the product after you uh, announce the sunset period but you may have additional sales uh, we provide names of other vendors who are willing to support the old product in case customer chooses to stay with the old product uh, that would be on some very, very large projects, but um, it's probably not too common, but uh, especially in niche markets, that may be an option. Uh, I know that certain CAD packages that supported plotters and stuff that become very popular, oftentimes um, will have such a situation. Uh, CAD is computer-aided design, if you're not familiar with that. And then we uh, terminate the customer product and withdraw the product from the market uh, when um, the time has has elapsed at which you've announced that that it would end. So you want to have some type of uniform process, and certainly marketing will be heavily involved with the sunsetting process, as well as the sustaining team, the team that provides maintenance for the product. They will be critical in determining what are the severe defects that need to be fixed and which can be um, not done. Uh, one of the things with customer support is that there generally is tiers of support. Uh, a direct customer contact tier will accept problems, prioritize problems, record problems, solve easy problems, and manage the problem resolution cycle. These will typically be your less experienced support people, and then additional layers will be on top of that where it gets escalated to more and more experienced levels of cu customer support. Um, and then... Um, a higher tier of specialized resources that sometimes talks to customers to resolve difficult problems with workarounds, and that can even uh, escalate to the level of a 
um, engineer that that field engineer that will actually go out to the site, especially with some of these big products, high dollar uh, products with um, maintenance, fairly expensive maintenance contracts. You may actually have uh, a service engineer that will show up on site if it gets to a problem that can't be solved at the earlier tiers. And then finally, um, it could reach the stage of a tier of experts that can fix and rebuild the code. Uh, certainly programmers are involved with this, but also um, there will be a cross-functional team that determines what is to be done because the decisions of providing fix and rebuilds and new re versions are not done in a bubble for the software engineers. We can't just say, oh, we see this problem and we know how to fix it and jump in to fix it. It is a cross-functional uh, team that decides this, uh, to the, uh, including the people who are selling it, the marketing folks, the people who are warehousing and storing that those uh, pieces of software equipment, um, all kinds of different people are involved, as well as um, customer support and quality. Quality will be very integrally involved with the process of, of um, supporting the product at those higher levels. So here's just sort of a pictorial diagram of a sample service and um, support organization. You can see here, you could have online, you could have phone calls, um, and then you could have a, a database of frequently asked questions with, with answers that are either provided online directly to the customer or are used by the support representatives. And um, then be, it could be, like we said earlier, um, escalate it to fix analysis and for possible problem fixes and updates, patch releases and, and the like. So again, the key thing that, to keep in mind here is the, the different layers of support and that the last level of support is the technical problem fix and, and analyst. And that happens again after a review. Um, I talked about this cross-functional team. The most common name for that is a change control board, and these can be very contentious meetings. I've been in quite a few, um, but this is where the team discuss uh, what to do and what things to take on and what things um, are not to be taken on, and the, also the approach. How are we going to take this on? Uh, again, the software engineers and the programmers are not on, allowed to uh, handle this in a bubble. It definitely goes through um, quite a lot of process, a cross-functional process um, to get to that point. Um, problem fixes, key parameter, keeping customer service, I mean, customer satisfied is to, the per to turn problem fixes around with some reasonable time frame. And this is, of course, uh, with um, defects and problems that are of significant um, impact, has a significant impact on the customer that determines which ones are done again. And then, um, then we basically build a contract around when the things will be done. This is generally done by a priority level. So here's a, um, a output from a, possibly a tool. And generally it is a tool that tracks this that where you set, you have the particular problem and priority levels. So um, here's an example priority level. Level one is severe functional problem with no workaround. You can imagine that uh, the organization I came from with a medical device, priority one would be catastrophic failure and possible injury. Uh, so that would be done immediately and in fact, the line would be shut down in such a situation. Uh, pr priority two here in this example is severe functional problem, but has a workaround. So this is something that um, the customer could do something about and work around it. It's inconvenient, but you can get work around the problem. Uh, so that would be have a lower pr priority. And then uh, the next one is level three, functional problem that has a workaround so that so this is just a functional one as opposed to a severe functional problem and then 
category five would be nice to have or to change that makes it a little bit more efficient or makes it look prettier, uh, whatever the case may be. And then associated with each of those product categories is um, the fixed response time uh, as soon as possible down to next product release or earlier. And then uh, as I've mentioned, there can be um, even lower level, a lower five, which is we're not, we're just plain not going to fix it. It's not something that we're going to be concerned about is also a possibility that's not on this particular slide. One of the things that uh, you have to have in place before you actually, um, I'm basically upfront in the design process is how will you go about installing fixes? So before the releases, you should have some scheme in place um, about how fixes are going to be installed on um, existing installations. Uh, customers do not always install a fixed release, provide the software support group. So one of the things that we have to do is, is try to encourage them because uh, I certainly fall into this category that I'll look at the list of defects that are being fixed and problems that are being addressed and say, is this worth it? Code seems to be stable. In my case, are these things that really things I want? Do I have what are the what is the possibility that it can make things worse rather than better? Uh, we certainly have experienced that with um, operating system releases and the like, and uh, definitely on your cell phones, same things go. So, um, but this causes the problem for support because um, you don't want to be supporting old releases, uh, and so this becomes problematic. So. One of the things that we do to get customers to move to future releases, we try to ex explain the potential serious problems that we're fixing, the benefits, and why this is a release that um, they should be interested and, in fact, in deploy on their system or upgrade in their system. So again, um, Generally, companies will have a limited number of application of, of old versions they'll support just because the cost of support, again, is high for supporting multiple versions. Um, so here's a sort of a timeline of when uh, product fix releases may be applied. And, and um, you can see here uh, the various stages at six months, 12 months, and 18 and 24 months. Um, we have various um, functions, the base, the manufacturing or distrib and distribution of the application, and then some of the financial issues. Um, and then you can see here the various fixes that um, that come across with different releases, release two, three, four, and basically you can outline the schedule of how you're going to roll out your releases. And again, your releases should have some numbering scheme that can convey the importance of fixes and what type of sub fixes they are. So you've most undoubtedly have been are familiar with um, numbering schemes for updates and, and bug patches versus major releases. So change control is important in support and maintenance because you need to be able to track the various versions um, and be able to re recreate uh, multiple versions in case you have to go back and uh, fix a catastrophic error. You, it is possible that you may have to go back to an older version. So change control is important. And also um, change control is important for prioritizing um, your fixes and being able to roll back fixes based on the success or failures of those fixes. Um, so a big part of change control is to ensure that all changes for fixes and for enhances are not arbitrary and capricious. In other words, they're relevant and important and not just something that uh, the programmer says, you know what, really be nice if I fix that. So what does this conflict with um, in terms of what we discussed in the software in our software engineering um, with regard to fixes and 
and fixing things. Can anyone think of something that I've said in the past that uh, might conflict with this guidance here? Okay, so what I'm what am kind of referring to or trying to um, get you to think about is we talked about how we want to refactor constantly to to not have broken windows and not have maintainable code, but it has to be done in a controlled fashion because um, you want to be able to control the changes and not cr create extra problems. So they have to be. Uh, when you refactoring and fixing code and making it more maintainable and more supportable, it has to be carefully um, integrated into your release schedules and your release um, strategy because you can't just arbitrarily do it, uh, which is what this change control board is. We have a release version of the software and we're not just going to willy-nilly or we're, going, we're getting close to release. We're not just going to arbitrarily make changes. So they have to be, when you're doing refactoring, once you get to the stage that you're either getting ready to release or you're making fixes to an already released product, it has to be carefully planned out when the impact of that refactoring and that um, maintenance of the software to make it more maintainable or easier to understand or better performance has to be carefully considered so that you don't make it at inopportune times and craze, create more problems than you fix. So um, again, the change control process is very important then. The CCB is the cross-functional team that has that responsibility. And then um, you need to have um, careful documentation that shows um, exactly what changes were done and your design so you can Imagine, and you'd be correct in that you actually do go through all the phases you went through, or most of the phases, I guess not all the phases, but most of the phases that you actually did in designing the project up front. You want to be clear on what the requirements were, are, you, you know, want to make sure those requirements are correct, that you're accomplishing the goals that you're trying to achieve. Um, and so, and then testing is even now even more important. So all the different phases that you can think of in the development cycle also um, is involved with the change process or, or most of them. Uh, again, we have the change control board, which is a processing committee. Uh, you you wanna have a well-defined workflow about how that happens. So origination of the change request, Approval of the change request, monitoring of the changes through uh, the fix and testing, and then closing the completed change as as fixed. Uh, this is all tracked. You want to probably track how long your estimate is and how long it actually happened for feedback into your process about how well you're doing at it. Um, and then one thing and then usually the workflow is automated through some tool. Um, uh, defect tracking software is very common, but it also can be in integrated into a larger package like uh, Visual Studio and Team Foundation Server. All has that kinds of stuff built into it once, once you get to uh, that level of development where you're having to maintain software and keep it uh, up to date and fix defects in the field. So, um, one thing is it's a very expensive process, so uh, oftentimes organizations will, will possibly have layered levels. So, for instance, in the organization I work with, we not only had a change control board, which was this um, multidiscipline um, and from all different aspects of the organization involved, but we did have a TRB, which was Technical Information Review Board, and that was typically right before release. But these were defects that were determined to be critical enough um, and uh, the, the solution was easy enough that um, it was de deemed appropriate to go through, not have to go through the change control board. But again, the criteria that you use for making that decision not to send something to change control board 
has to be well defined. Otherwise, uh, of course, it could be ab abused. Uh, here's what a change request form could look like. Uh, certainly, you want to know who actually is requesting the change. Uh, again, the request number, you, you always have a unique identifier. It's a pretty common theme in software processes and processes in general. Uh, what the date was, when it was accepted or rejected, um, a description of the change request, uh, impact of the change request. And, it, and here, I would also uh, if, say that if this is a defect, you want information about how to recreate this defect because that will help in the fix process is how can I recreate this problem so I can actually see it for myself and figure out what to do. And then the uh, estimate of the effort um, and then, you know, whatever other information is important to the organization. I have uh, referred to um, various defect tracking software. TFS has defect tracking software but uh, Bugzilla is an open source um, one as well. Uh, so basically uh, you can use that for free and you can see here that we have a bug ID and the summary and the status. Um, and then you can add tracking information and you can see here on the right is this is, is how you would actually enter in your defects um, through a entry screen. And then you notice the bug ID actually, well, I don't know if you can tell or not, but it's clickable. You can actually click on that uh, bug ID and it, it can jump you to either the change set for the fix or documentation, uh, SQA verification information. So you can actually tie generally um, a particular defect with also supporting uh, documents that refer to either documentation of the defect or of the fix or of the testing of that defect once it's been fixed. So uh, definitely when you get into this realm, a tool is highly valuable for tracking and, and keeping control of the management of defects. One thing to keep in mind here is that SQA is heavily involved in the, this process. And in fact, they may be the owner of the process, that it's not the software engineers that are managing this defect process, but it is managed by the SQA team because they're in um, a good position to, to track the, the status of a particular defect through the, the fix cycle. So oftentimes they may become the owner of this. Now you, uh, as a developer, will certainly be uh, highly involved in this process and will be owner of various aspects of um, particular defects and particular stages of the handling of defects. But overall, uh, it is very typical or can be typical for SQA to drive that effort to be the ultimate owner of the overall process. Any questions? I think that is the end of maintenance and support. Again, uh, I think a key thing I hope you get from this is that this is an important uh, aspect of the system that release of the software is not the end. And in fact, it's only very, very much the beginning uh, with the process. Okay. Okay, I'm getting up my next pre presentation here. Okay. So what I'm going to have here is an example that I will share with you. Where is it? Screen one. Here we go. So uh, you should see uh, my example. Um, so pretty much straightforward. We have the team. Uh, it's the 100 Acre Woods team. The team members are Winnie the Pooh, et cetera, et cetera. You are in, in Tigger. Uh, and then the time period that this uh, 
document is for sort of a summary of what happened. So this week we were going to plan to catch up on the project. We meant to create a work log and catch up on what we needed to do. We spent some time working the SDS and the requirements. The biggest problem was that we spent a lot of time unsuccessfully looking for honey. And we talk about issues encountered here. So issues encountered, we're figuring out how we should update the functionality in certain UI pages. We decided to combine some pages that were separate in the original. Communication with the SQL server has proven more complicated than really thought and is resulting in more time being required to complete the SQA module. So here we can see issues encountered. Uh, one thing here is the, the aspects, the things that you include in your report should call out explicitly what the, um, hopefully the recipient of this document has been, is asking for. Make it clear and, co and concise where the information is that they're looking for. If not, you have to figure out your audience and determine what it is that they're import is important to them um, and include that. So doing, but um, this is something I certainly have was figured, figured out the hard way. Uh, I was dealing with document services, which is basically approving the, the submission of any artifacts and documents or even um, products and software, finished software. Uh, and they actually called out for specific information. And I would put the information in the fields that they say that they want in this general text block. And it would get kicked back and says, and they would say, nope, you don't have that information. Please resubmit with that information. And I'm looking at it. Well, it's right there where I put it. And the solution, believe it or not, was to put a tag like this issues encountered colon in front of the text, the exact same text I had before, and actually explicitly outline that's where it was, resubmit it, and the pers same person who rejected it approved it because there now I actually labeled it. It may seem obvious to us as we submit this, but you want to make sure it's obvious to the recipient of your document, um, the information that they are looking for is there and that they can easily find that information. So that's something that you should think about in the format of your document. Uh, all your documents is who is the audience and how can I make sure that they're getting the information they need and that they're able to find the information that they need uh, quickly. So in this discussion, I am hope you're you're gathering that this is an important skill to have because you're doing this all the time. And the other thing is these work logs are very helpful for you per professionally as well because it is very common for um, a weekly or a monthly or even a daily status report, hopefully not because that takes a lot of time, uh, to be submitted to somebody. And so, um, that uh, is useful to have those kinds of skills to professionally present information in a way that's easily uh, readable and the information um, gleaned by your recipient of the document. The other thing is you will undoubtedly, I, I can't think of very many organizations that don't have, be going through an appraisal process, which the appraisal process is used for promotions, used for determining um, raises and, and salary management. So um, it's important to, to have so, sort of a diary of the things that you are doing so that you can actually have a much easier time writing these, these annual appraisal or biannual appraisal reports uh, because you have the information and you don't have to go digging for it. You have it. So keeping a diary is useful. And then the other thing is for those elevator presentations or pitches or the meeting in the field, in the um, hall or, or wherever you, you are, at the water cooler, um, if someone asks you a question like your manager, to be have sort of a recollection of the things that you're doing and what some of the key issues are that you've put together in your diary uh, can be uh, very valuable in helping you uh, accomplish that.
in a in a more uh, concise way, and to, and to be prepared for those situations. Uh, moving on, so here this is oriented to our work activity log, which is basically the description that um, I gave you for the assignment. Uh, so here I, I like tables. Um, I have sort of a preference for tables, but you know whatever form you can put it in. But you know you do want to make it uh, visually ap uh, appealing. Oh, so I have a content from Ochir. I had to report it daily at some point. And it had to work with time management software called Clarizen. I'm probably mispronouncing it. And we had to record our time on an hourly basis. Wow. That's some heavy duty micromanagement there. Yeah. So it is uh, uncommon. I'm not too uncommon. So Tier actually ha is reporting that he was on the extreme end of that spectrum of how often you have to report. So um, here we have. Uh, the members and their individual tasks. These are the tasks. This is the amount of time that was spent on them. Um, and then we have our meetings. What the, were the tasks um, that we work, we discussed and worked on and what was the time spent? So expectations. So this was an area that I got questions about. What is this expectations and expectations met and unmet? Aren't these subjective? Uh, so the main point here is um, something that you will hear in business a lot, and that's your roles and responsibility. So you want to make your uh, expectations and, and the roles and, and what people are responsible for explicit. And so that's what I'm looking for. And so if you had difficulties determining what the, when you're writing your report, what the expectations were, and whether they were met and unmet, uh, that's sort of a sign that those definitions weren't clearly defined up front, and maybe that would be a good practice to do with your team interactions. Now, you guys are teams of twos and three, and so you're working more pretty closely with each other, and it may not be as critical, but it's certainly a good habit to get into is being clear about what, what the person is tasked with what the expectations are, and then um, it's good to go through and say, okay, these have been met, these are unmet, so they become action items to go ahead and try to meet them. And you can actually look at unmet um, expectations and say, hmm, if this continues on, maybe this is an area of attention that we need to look at, and maybe we're taking the wrong approach. Maybe it's taking so long not because the person isn't capable of doing this job, but maybe we've outlined the wrong approach to solving this particular task. So that's where this expectations met and unmet is coming from, is have you establish what the tasking is and what the expectations for those tasks are so that we can easily tell whether they're met or unmet. So one thing that you will hear um, especially when it comes to doing appraisal input, you know, being evaluated for your salaries or, or raises or promotions is SMART. How many, who has heard of the acronym SMART? And what does it stand for? Does it, has anyone heard of that? Well, I'm guessing we're not talking about hard drive diagnostics, so. No, no, not hard drive di diagnostics. Oh. So we have a yes from Nathan. So do you recall what SMART stood for, Nathan? Give Nathan a little respond, time to respond. Okay. Anyway, I will go ahead and, and jump in. So SMART spent, stands for specific. So you want to be specific with your, uh, there we go. I, I don't have to, there he's got it now. So it's specific, measurable, assigned. Actually, I believe it's it's attainable. So you actually want something, you want to have tasks that you're actually 
impossible to um, solve. So he actually used a, a sign, but I believe it's attainable. And then realistic. Uh, okay, so that would be attainable, would be realistic. Uh, but generally, I um, associate uh, R with relevant. So they want to be tasks that are important and things that we really want to do. And then time focus. So time focus is when is it going to be done? So yes, time focus is the last. So that was awesome. Yeah, I only differed with you on two of them, and it could be just different definitions. Uh, yeah, so um, Nathan says, I, I think I learned the older one first. Yeah, so um, again, specific. We want to be very clear what it is, the task we're doing, what it is we're trying to accomplish. Uh, that's specific. Um, measurable means can we tell if it's met or unmet? And is there a way that we can actually easily discern whether it's met or unmet? Because if we can't, then what's the point? If we don't know that we were able to accomplish, then this probably hasn't been laid out or explained correctly. Uh, attainable means, yeah, it's something that we think we can accomplish. We're not going to put all these pie in the sky things in there that um, we don't even think we could do. What's the point there? You could you could put them as in in a document of stretch goals and for thing people to be thinking about it, a Kaizen kind of thing. These are problems that we'd like to address, but we're not quite sure how we can do it. Maybe you could put them on a list, um, but it wouldn't be your expectation, certainly. And then um, time focus. When are we expecting this to be accomplished? And this will help us measure if, again, whether we need to start taking other approaches on things. And then uh, lastly, we have here the action items for winning the Pooh and Christopher Robin. Here are the tasks that we want them to do. And again, uh, you may want to use SMART to determine whether uh, each of these are. So here you can see that in particular that these aren't actually time bound. The assumption might be that it's for this week. And you may want to go ahead and state that in all things here. Um, the assumption is it'll be finished by next week unless otherwise stated or something like that. You could do something like that as well. But that's sort of an idea of work activity lo uh, log um, and sort of sort of lessons I'd like you to learn from it and some of the takeaways I want to get um, have you get from how this applies, not just to this class, because if it applied just to this class, then it would be absolutely useless. Um, I want you to be able to take what we learned or what's being conveyed in a work activity log and be able to apply it to um, any jobs you end up going to. So. Still sharing your screen, heads up. Um, I'm sharing screen is what you're saying? Okay, yes. Yeah, just you have mail. Okay. So might not want that. Just in case I had something sensitive underneath it or something, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. I could just use that screen as my presentation screen. Um, so let's see. By the way, that's my nephew uh, playing tennis there. Um, I'm trying to decide. Let's see. We have about 10 Looks minutes. Looks like a sensitive. Yeah, some personal and sensitive information. Uh I have about 10 minutes, so I think I'll just go over the questions. I was trying to decide whether I'm going to go over the design problem, but it looks like I probably don't quite have the time to do that. So let's bring up the document. For not the design problem, but just the questions. So here we have uh, the design questions. Just go through them pretty quickly. I think all of you do pretty well on these in general. So define the depth versus the breadth issue in software complexity. The depth problem addresses the complexity in relationships among the components or items. So this is interrelationships, functions, um, 
and coupling and cohesion kind of thing. Uh, the relationship may be in the form of sharing data, transferring control among the components, or some kind of data and linkage, control linkage. The breadth problem refers to simply the sheer number of things. So how many components, how much different are they, um, and how many, what are the functions and components, how many functions and components are we going to have? So it's just the sheer numbers issue there is the breadth. Um, describe a couple of ways to simplify a complex problem. The answer I was looking for, because these were based on chapters, is a common attribute among the methodologies of simplification is to lessen the relationships, number of functionalities, amount of interact interactions, and so on. One such, such, one such technique is decomposition, and another is modularization. So I had a number of students that went beyond, because I think this was from, I can't even remember, chapter two or something like that. Uh, and that's where this answer came from, the question and the answer. But a lot of you actually took information for further chapters and said this, these can all be applied to that as well. And that was a very astute observation, and I did give you credit for that. Uh, what are the four most important reasons for project success? Uncovered by the chaos report. Uh, that was pretty straightforward. User involvement, ex executive management support, clear requirement statements, and proper planning. Discuss one advantage and one disadvantage of the waterfall process. The main ones are the waterfall model has a disadvantage of very little task overlap. It's not incremental. It's a sequential process and a single iteration. The main advantage is that you can easily monitor the progress um, of the process. So it's easy to monitor, but it has serious shortcomings in terms of usage. Uh, so again, many possible answers were possible. Many answers were possible there. Your software. Uh, department was ranked as CMM maturity level two using the stage representation model. The previous review, your department was ranked as level one. Explain the process areas the department had in effect when ranked at level one. And the answer there is that we had no processes in fact in, in place. And I actually had some, a lot of people tell me what was added in level two. That wasn't actually asked for, but that was amazing that you went ahead and did that. Uh, what is test-driven programming and what actual process advocates it? And here we have interest-driven development. Testing is done continuously and automated as much as possible. Programmers write unit tests for all their code in certain situations and actually typically uh, test first development is performed where we write the test before you actually write the actual implementation code. You, and then key there is you keep running the test all the time. And this is actually Act advocated in the XP methodology or extreme programming methodology. In many cases, the company's product may have changes before the software product release. Using traditional development methods, does the Agile method address this issue? And if so, how? Yes, by having short releases of the software and giving and given to the customer as often as possible. In this manner, changes during the development process do not have to have as large an impact on work already done because you're com com constantly iterating. So any work that you throw away is small because the iterations are small, uh, typically a week long iteration. So you're limiting the amount of work that's being thrown away. For what is the viewpoint oriented requirements definition method use? This method is based on understanding that requirements are not viewed the same by different stakeholders. So this uh, methodology requires correcting requirements and ensure that all different aspects are different perspectives from your customer uh, stakeholders are provided and considered. Uh, explain how the requirements prioritization list is used to prune the requirements. And this is many times all identified requirements cannot be developed and delivered due to resource, time, or capability limitations. So we can't always do everything we want. The requirements are prioritized in order of importance. The last requirement in the priority list would be the best to eliminate from the system development if um, you don't have enough resources. Uh, the question 10, uh, Unfortunately, some of you actually went through, uh, is described the th three or four different views used in Rational Unified Process. Unfortunately, some of you actually did uh, describe the uni Rational Unified Process steps as opposed to the architectural design. Uh, the art, uh, so I gave you partial credits, especially if you did a good job of describing the Rational Unified Process uh, design process. But what I was looking for was the architectural design, which were logical view process of view, subsystem decomposition view, 
and physical architecture view. Uh, the logical view was basically your object-oriented design, typically uh, used in UML design processes. Process view is the processes. Sus subsystem decomposition views are the layers, right? Modules and subsystems. And the physical architecture is tying it to hardware, showing how your software actually ties into the hardware being used. And then question 11 is the design problem, and I will leave that for the next lecture, which is, remind you, lecture on Monday. Uh, there is no class on Friday. So any questions? Okay, you're welcome to stay uh, if you want to chat with me, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and start stop the recording now, and you are